Hello, folks, and greetings from the far east of the Western North American world. Uh, as one, uh, actually, our previous speaker quoted the HIMSS definition for interoperability as it describes the extent to which systems and devices can exchange data and interpret that shared data. And that for two systems to be interoperable, they must be able to exchange data and subsequently present that data such that it can be understood by a user. Now that's the key part here, is that it's not just about the technology, folks, and a lot of us that have the scars of interoperability, it's not just around the technological issues, that systems need to be people interoperable, whether that be the health professional or others. In the meantime, we are pleased uh, today to have with us several industry leaders to speak about their interoperability experiences and perhaps offer us some uh, concrete actions that uh, could help accelerate clinical information sharing. Uh, from the private sector perspective. Joining us today, on my immediate right, is Jennifer McGregor, Managing Director of Allscripts Canada. In the middle, we have Mr. Barry Burke, Vice President, Healthcare Industry, IBM Canada. And on the, the far end of the line is Mike Checkley, President and CEO of QHR Technologies. The format that we will take here today will be a, a brief presentation by our three uh, panelists, followed by uh, question and answer and discussion after that fact. So with that in mind, or with that in order, I will ask Jennifer McGregor to take the podium. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you for joining, and thank you for staying with us here, because I know we're between you and some sociables, so I appreciate that. A little bit about Allscripts. We're a global healthcare solution provider enabling our clients to innovate and transform healthcare to improve outcomes and sustain their healthcare systems. We have a large client base in Canada. We do operate globally. However, in Canada, we have a number of our clients utilizing our advanced electronic health record for both ambulatory and acute called Sunrise. It is a Canadian innovation. In fact, it was born here in British Columbia. We also have a citizen engagement portal called Follow My Health, and we call it a citizen engagement portal, not a patient portal, and that is purposeful. We also have our interoperability and population health platform called DB Motion. And our vision is an open, connected community of health. And we have a number of clients who share that vision. We have our DB Motion platform where we can connect disparate systems. To date, we've connected over 800 different systems. We connect these disparate systems and we gather, aggregate, and harmonize data. And then we present that data to the clinician within their workflow which is absolutely essential as they're making critical decisions at the point of care. This data can then be used with population health analytics to make better decisions overall. In particular, I would like to highlight Fraser Health Authority, who's here in the room, and Manitoba, who are utilizing DB Motion and together have connected close to 600 different sites and sharing clinical information across them. But today, I'm going to share a different story. It's a story about interoperability, and it's a story about success. And it comes at a great time, because just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being in Israel. So just to put some context, there are four HMOs in Israel that are responsible for delivering health care to over 8 million Israeli citizens. They provide universal coverage, they are non-governmental, they're not-for-profit, and the services they offer are part of a basket of services that are defined and set forth by the Ministry of Health and they are regulated. Compared to our 11% GDP national spend, they actually spend less and achieve better outcomes. They embarked on a digital health strategy. They decided to capitalize 
on the unique opportunity to plan and lead a technology revolution that would enable them to meet present and future needs across their healthcare system while assuring access to care and system-wide equity. And they did so by forming a foundation. Once they had the technology and the support structures in place, they really focused on building these building blocks, much as what we're looking at today in Canada and what we're doing across the world. They built an EMR everywhere strategy where every organization has an EMR. They then built the health data platform, which allowed them to use, smartly use de-identified data for their academia and research and to make decisions at a management level. And they implemented a continuous care HIE that was cross-organizational, multi-domain, and exchanged information for the patient to be available at the point of care just in place, just in time, no matter where you were, and really form that platform of the continuum of care. And it was used within the organizations and between organizations. But please look at the two pillars on the side. They established systematic innovation as a guiding principle, and of course, governance and regulation and policy as seen by, um, overseen by the Ministry of Health. But when they started with their foundation, and I'll talk to that with their largest HMO, which is Clalit, which serves 52% of the population, once they had that foundation in place, they were actually able to connect the entire state of Israel in two and a half years. So in two and a half years, they were able to connect all of their hospitals, communities, providers, sharing information as demographics, diagnoses, encounters, medications, immunizations, case and procedures, visit summaries. In fact, as of 2014, they were seeing six million pages viewed per month and over 700,000 new entries per month. In fact, it's such a highly used system that we could no longer watch the usage because it was too much of a drain on the system because it was just overused. We stopped reporting on the usage in 2014. There are gaps that they're focusing on and the next phase will really be around point of care analytics, driving big data, connecting in some gaps, because there still are some gaps with mental health and uh, geriatric hospitals. They're also going to be looking at some additional clinical domains to connect as far as discharge summaries and procedure notes. But really their focus was developing an innovation <coughs> platform. And so we look at some of their key success factors, and what they were able to achieve. I put it into three areas. They had a vision. This was going to be transformative in nature. They articulated the vision. Leaders got behind the vision. They focused on where those pain points were. They were purposeful. They drove local innovation capabilities at the forefront. Everybody was on board. They started with a strong technology foundation in Clalit, which is again the largest HMO, who had the continuum care HIE in place, DB motion. They took that as the gold standard and they rapidly deployed it across the state. And those guiding principles and governance were essential in this process. They really wanted to focus on patient-centered participatory care. This is gonna state the, set the foundation for where they're going as far as sustainable health, personalized medicine, genomics, making better decisions for your patients based on their biological markers or variants. They clearly were able to articulate the overarching strategy and the plan. And they devised that information is the lifeline, but innovation is our practice. And that was a real key to their success. Now they did have some challenges. 
as you saw, one of the building blocks to information as a lifeline was their EMRs. So they did focus on making sure that every office IDN hospital had a, an EMR. And you can imagine some of the unique challenges that they faced in the state of Israel. But they were able to drive that level of collaboration and focus across the entire state to come together to connect it all. One integrated electronic health record for one person across the state. The rest of the world is doing in terms of tackling similar challenges that we have in this country, and hopefully there's uh, many examples, much like we saw this morning with our friend from Cleveland, that we can learn from in this country, even though we still have a, a completely different governance model and basis for how our health system is delivered in this country. I now ask to the podium Mr. Barry Burke, Vice President of Healthcare Industry, IBM Canada. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Hold your applause till the end. <clears throat> um, People have been asking me all day what I'm doing on this panel, and uh, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, this was the only access to the comfy chairs, was you had to be, <laughs> and by the way, my butt is killing me, so this is very nice to be up here. Um, further to my skills and expertise, when I look around the, uh, the room here and do see the skills and expertise in this area, it kind of reminds me of when my daughter was born. <clears throat> and I've got a commerce degree from the University of Manitoba. Uh, my, my daughter was born in a hospital. And in case you guys don't know, they're chock full of nurses and doctors and people with all kinds of medical education. <clears throat> so after she was born, they had the audacity to hand me some sort of weapons, ask me if I would like to cut the cord. And my answer then and my answer now is, surely there's someone more qualified. So uh, <laughs> in spite of that, here I am. Um, I thought there was a couple of good comments from this morning that, uh, that relate to uh, my comments. So you know, when Dr. Harris talked about, uh, actually in a quote, technology does not transform. I think that's an important thing that we need to uh, remember along this journey. And my, I will talk about what I think is working, what's not, and what's next. And I think there were a couple of comments that he made. He also talked about going back inside to focus on process, and I will talk a little bit about that as well. Um, he talked about the provider and patient focus and how that basically drove the need and drove <clears throat> when you put them as the, as the core, whichever half of the chart you wanted to look at, it sort of drove the need, the requirement, or the, the absolute need for, for interoperability. So I think that was you know, important and, and actually very much relates to the comments that I would have to make. So you know, when I look at what I think might be working, and, and all of these you can argue with and by all means do, um, you know, general recognition of the value of e-health. If I go back, and I've been doing this for a long time, I think there was a complete, I was going to say skepticism, but there's a, it's a word beyond skepticism, just disbelief that this IT stuff could help in any way. Um, it was just seen as a black hole of cost. Cost went in, nothing good came out. And I think we've now moved to a recognition that in the area of digital health that there is a value to it and that there is, it, it's a tool of potential transformation. Um, for Don and Shelley from the standards world and for many of you from the standards world, I think, I think the idea of international standards obviously have a, have a, a two-way street. <clears throat> when we focus on international standards, it will allow companies like an IBM Canada, looking at it from a Canadian perspective, where we, we make investments to be able to potentially garner some investment money because we can look in this and say, well, this will work outside of a Canadian context. Similarly, if we're doing something... Uh, very unique in Timbuktu, and it's to, uh, to international standards, we can bring it to Canada. So that's, you know, I think that's, that's got the potential to work and, and always has had a great promise that it will work, and I think it's, I think it's sort of getting there. I think there's a, also a growing consensus, and we've talked about it when we talked about um, patients, consumers, the idea of growing this, this digital health definition. You know, back when we were allowed to call it e-health, um, it, it seemed to be very focused on, on certainly the, the infrastructure and the plumbing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I think now this idea of digital health, including more on what the providers want and need from a transformation perspective, more of what the potential patients or consumers or public in a, uh, in a Canadian context need, I think allows us to expand the, uh, the definition of, of digital health. Uh, what needs focus or improvement? I think one of the challenges that we're all going to run into, and some of the people in, in this room, uh, Michael, I don't know if he's here, but certainly run into it, is the concept, you know, the belief at certain levels, uh, and particularly the levels where they have money, that you know, digital health, yeah, got that, we did that. 
that was great. We enjoyed that, and it's you know that it needs to be seen as. And Michael had a great uh, you know a great uh, analogy to the the iceberg and you know whether how much of the iceberg is actually showing. And you know I talk about it in terms of foundation. You sort of built the foundation to a house, but you haven't built the house yet. But you can't build the house without the foundation. So now is not the time to stop. Um, speaking of stopping, um, funding. Um, when I look at this whole area of interoperability, and, and, and may, again, I'm a, a simple um, uh, commercial interest, and money seems to talk. Money is the magic solution to all things, and at some level, it is a little bit in this case as well. I mean, <clears throat> if, you, if you looked at interoperability and somehow believed that it would happen magically, it certainly won't happen magically. And I was just in a couple of sessions that, uh, that Glenn was involved in, Glenn Geiger from TOH, and you know, this, it takes a force of nature, it takes will, it takes political will, it takes um, time and patience, but at some level it also takes some money, and that funding needs to come from somewhere. And I think back to the idea of it's not finished, you know, all of the, the cool and sexy stuff, and I work for IBM, so I have to mention the name Watson, otherwise they won't pay me this month, but you know, when you look at some, you know, all of these cool technologies, Watson not was, uh, among them, um, the, the neat things that you might see out in the showcase later today, it all had to be built on this foundation. So the foundation was great, and all the work that Infoy did and all the work that we all did to create that foundation was critical, but you, you're not, you needed that to get to the sexy stuff, and there's gonna be some money that's gonna be required to get to the sexy stuff as well. The, you know, Dr. Harris talked this morning, and Glenn has talked about it, and there was through the CMIO panel, they talked about this whole area of process. So looking at this not as, not as encounters, not as, not as technology stops along the way, but in fact a process. This is a process. You're not, you're not an encounter. You're not a, a technology um, that you're, that you're uh, interacting with as a patient. You're, in fact, there to go through a process from beginning to end. And looking at that process and looking for the ways that we can improve the process, sometimes with technology, sometimes with common sense, sometimes with you know, lean methodology or whatever the, whatever the cool thing is at the time, but to look at this really as a process and, and to, when you think about the idea of clinical interoperability and how important that becomes to, to that process improvement. Um, cloud platforms, so I, I, you know, there was a couple of things I read recently that talked about, well, don't worry, this is all gonna be fixed because we'll just put it on the cloud. And again, I do work for IBM and uh, we do, turns out, have cloud computing and we kind of believe in it. But it's also not the, not the solution, it's not the panacea, and it's not the solution to the world's problems. In fact, if you're not interoperable on-premises, you're not gonna be interoperable on, uh, in a cloud environment. It, it, they need to be designed to enable it, not to restrict it, and I think that's just something that we need to be thinking of. Uh, new clinical systems don't fix interoperability. So we, again, we have, <clears throat> I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of customers, um, some of them less enlightened than others, who think they're gonna move to a new clinical system or a new system of some kind, and that's going to, well, that'll fix interoperability. In fact, it probably exposes the need for thinking differently about process and about interoperability. It's not a matter of putting in system X or Y, that's not gonna fix it. Um, patients, so when you think about patients, and again, back to, what the doctor talked about this morning in the Cleveland Clinic. Um, when you start thinking about it from a patient perspective and a consumer perspective, um, you know, I don't know about you, but when I do a Google search on something, I don't particularly know how many servers or how many machines it hit or whether it went to the moon and back. I just know I get an answer. And I think as, as we start to focus on consumers, I mean, going across traditional silos, the idea of true interoperability, it'll just be expected. It's not gonna be, I, I put down the word demand, I'm not sure it's, it'll just be, it's there or I don't use it. And if I don't use it, and that somehow is disadvantaging me from in terms of the, the, what I can get out of the healthcare system, that's not gonna be acceptable. So it's gonna become a very big issue, I believe. I think the other thing is that <clears throat> in terms of what's next, you know, interoperability, it's you know, back to the sort of sexy stuff, the Watsons, the cognitive computing, the analytics, the the mobile apps, all the things that we want to do and need to do, are going to presume that that's there. That, it, that has to be there for this to work. So I think there is, you know, there's a lot of things that are working and a lot of people in the room here have done a, a, you know, a great job in, in getting us to the point we are. I think there's a bunch of investments that we can, and Michael talked about this morning, that we need to build upon and you know, supporting the InfoWay agenda is probably part of that. Um, some great things we can do in the short term, some great things we need to do to continue to build the foundation for the future. So. I look forward to your questions. And by the way, this is all I know, so don't ask too many more questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Burke. Next up will be Mr. Mike Checkley, President and CEO of QHR Technologies. 
So thank you. Uh, so QHR, uh, so we at QHR are probably most famous for our EMR program, which is called Acuro, um, or maybe for our little gray pen that you all got in your bags. Um, it's really nice to meet all of you, getting lots of great feedback. Um, they are good pens. Um, but I think we've got a pretty good EMR too. Uh, I've, had the, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with our, our EMR software program uh, really from inception. Uh, I started life as a computer programmer, a developer, uh, then a designer and really now a business manager. So I've seen a lot of different perspectives on interoperability. So I want to do my best for the next five minutes to summarize that for you. And uh, really, if I could just offer one point, it would be that I really think that the level of success or failure of systems integration is directly proportional to how well we, in which stakeholder perspectives are addressed. And so here's ours. Uh, this is our market. Um, you know, we've got two products as a, as a software uh, tech, well, healthcare technology company, really. Uh, the first is our Acuro electronic medical records program being used by about 7,000 doctors across Canada at the moment. Uh, we're adding about 1,200 new doctors annually to this count. And then we also have a new product, which is called Medio, um, known as Virtual Care Platform, but we're extending that to be a full patient platform with online booking, secure messaging, and patient records. Our concept here is connecting the groups together to create better connectivity and interoperability. This does not exist in a silo. It must exist well with the other systems around it, including hospital and lab, which is uh, integrations that we've done with many of you in this room. So as a business, our accountability is really to three groups. I really want to, again, loop back to that perspective. And that's number one is our customers, uh, number two is our employees, and number three is our shareholders. Um, and, uh, but the reality for us is that we have way more project requests than we can handle. And so we have to prioritize. And so the projects that really get our attention are the ones that address those three groups. So I'm really looking for a projects um, that are game changer interfaces that our customers will love, super easy and low stress to roll out for staff and make us a ton of money. If we can address all three of those, we'll be good. <laughs> so um, here's three common questions I get uh, as, a, as an EMR vendor. So the first is, how do we motivate EMR vendors to participate in our projects? Now I'm offering just our perspective. <laughs> The f it used to be funding, right? I think that was really uh, the, the answer of, of, of the past. But I think that was really because many of us were, were fairly new, at least we were fairly new. We were mostly unprofitable and we're really trying to find our market fit. Um, I believe that's shifting, at least for us, in being far more motivated to offer functionality that's got as broad of a reach as possible to as many customers as possible. We're trying to run one single code base across the country. And I know you've all heard this before, but it does present a pretty significant challenge to develop interfaces at the jurisdictional level, all different from each other, when trying to run that single base. So what we're trying to do is look for ways where we can combine projects together, um, or at least the designs, to make our efforts more efficient and our rollouts more broad. Number two is how do we engage with the many different EMR products and companies out there? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I like to say just pick up the phone. Um, I think that, you know, our, our standard answer is let's just form a committee, right? Let's just get them all in a room and that will solve things. Uh, but I think EMR engagement works best, at least initially, one-on-one. -on -one. Reach out, gain alignment, then bring the groups together so you understand fully what their perspectives are and uh, can have much more efficient conversations. Um, there's, there's less and less EMRs, right? The market's consolidated quite a bit. But it's, each of us are still pretty different with um, respect to our approach to projects, the timing, and even the difficulty. So we may have common interests, right, but the competitive nature really does limit those 100% conversations, which is really where we need to get to to get this planning done. Um, <clears throat> from our perspective, um, note that if you get a whole bunch of EMRs in a room, you know, we are in a place where we're trying to balance our time, right, between the projects that connect us together and, of course, the innovation that differentiates us against each other. Finally, is what role do EMRs play with interoperability? Pretty broad question. I'll attack it from one angle here. And that's that I would say that, you know, EMR uh, are, are now pretty functional and rich. And as said, we need to figure out, and this is on us, really, we need to figure out faster and more efficient ways to engage and complete these projects. 
um, we are backlogged with projects. But in our partnerships outside of government, um, in industry, we are able to create interoperability in general faster. And this is really for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, the scope is often smaller, right? Because we can design it that way. Um, but we also leverage different kind of technologies. Like we leverage APIs and we leverage, um, you know, RESTful interfaces. We've got very, very small teams with customer engagement immediately. And we start as small as possible and then just extend and iterate over time as opposed to set out broad goals and do a big bang project um, off the bat. But I would submit that EMRs are playing an increasing role over time, just due to, well, number one, market consolidation, but also adoption. Meaning EMRs can be very powerful allies to you, creating access to a lot of end users uh, in your rollouts. Okay, so let's get into some some uh, concrete tips, I guess, or advice that I would that I would offer. So relating back to my main point on perspective. So first of all, design. I really believe in bottom-up design. Design projects from the end user perspective upwards, and even start by writing your press release. Like, start with that, and refer back to it as often as possible. And this will help focus project decisions and help to control scope creep. Secondly is on compatibility. Um, and compatibility to me is all about choice. Offering choice to obtain maximal compatibility with a broad range of systems. Like as an example, if you've got something, you know, can it be done with a browser launch to a view as an option for vendors with limited resource availability as opposed to a full discrete data synchronization? The market will push the vendors on design if you give us the choice. And you've already stated what you want users to be capable of in point one, in your purpose. Thirdly, and um, this is probably the one I've got the most emphasis on, um, and uh, that's to focus uh, project vision on rollout, um, not with pilots. I'm really anti-pilot. Pilots are great as a step along the way, but I'm anti-pilot um, as, a, as a goal. Uh, if you're pilots are great if you're uncertain if your idea is any good, right? Let's do a pilot and see if it works, see if it's, you know, but I really think that we can commit, and instead of taking the funding and offering it at the pilot stage, uh, or for development milestones, put the bag of chips on the other side of the finish line, right? And, uh, and pay for success directly. Uh, so in summary, I should wrap up here. In summary, reality is that, you know, healthcare, you know, has had a lot of need for efficiency, which has really sparked up a lot of siloed technology solutions that have very little adherence to, you know, really an, an, an overarching plan. And so to connect them, it's possible and we all think it's a good idea, us included, but it really can only be done with good perspective-based thinking on design and approach. Thanks.